And Nestle has tried to respond to this challenge um, by trying to change the culture of Nestle to make it more open and able to adapt. And so this is their thing, which they, they actually started about uh, 10 years ago. It's called Nestle on the Move, from that sort of culture to that sort of culture. Um, and a cynic in Nestle said to me, well, basically they're the same. That's just that culture looking from the top. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, will, you will be familiar with this. Um, this is moving from a hierarchical culture to a network culture, moving from a top-down sort of culture to a, a much more aligned culture, basing the culture more on cooperation, less on competition, uh, more on initiative, less, less structure and discipline. Um, and this one, perhaps most interestingly, trying to move away from a sort of national, functional thinking to a much more cross-border, cross-functional thinking. And I guess that's what I've seen my role as, as, as a trainer, perhaps, perhaps particularly in this area, trying to, trying to help this process. And to be honest, uh, 10 years later, uh, most parts of Nestle, of course you have to understand Nestle is very large, so you can't expect everything to move at the same pace. They're probably about here. Uh, you know, they're, they're still a very long way from creating that sort of culture. Which, which says something about the strength of cultures and the difficulty of changing cultures and developing cultures. Um, if you ask them, why do they want to be like this? Uh, what's the advantage of being like this, uh, as opposed to that? Then, of course, it's about responsibility, accountability, empowerment, getting people to, to get more involved in the business. But I think it's also about something else. It's actually, they feel that the people that they're recruiting nowadays fit better or are happier working in that sort of culture than that sort of culture. So I think that's... That's another very interesting thing about this type of training, is that I think very often what we're doing is we're matching up our personal values uh, against uh, the company values and seeing to the extent to which we fit. Okay, so that, that's Nestle's response, uh, part of their response. Um, and you know, if I, if, if I was to sort of put my finger on the biggest issue that they face, uh, it is that these functional silos, if you take, for example, R&D, their technical area versus their market, are still very, very strong. And they're extremely difficult for the R&D people to talk successfully to the, the marketing people. And that's, that's the sort of thing that we try to help them to do. Uh, I'll, come to that. I'll come to that later. Um, so, what about, what about Zilabe? So this is, this is my second case um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, Zilabe, uh, around two, two, two and a half thousand people. Very, very, I mean, I, again, a stereotype, I guess, of, of companies of this type in Germany. Very, very high quality, very, very uh, good technology. And this, in a way, has been their big, big challenge over the last 10 years becoming international. They've set up subsidiaries across the world. I mean, one of the most important subsidiaries for them is in China, of course, um, where the growth is phenomenal that they've already got there. But the, the difficulty that they have, and the people that we train, is that although 60% of their business is now outside Germany, 90% um, of the people are still in Germany. And of this 90%, there are only probably about 20 who travel a lot and who are extremely open to what can be understood, the opportunities there are across the world. And the, all the rest of them who are in the groups that we train are not. Are not. You know, they, they, they've lived 100 years in this sort of small German valley building up this very successful company and now they're being told that they need to listen to the Chinese or they need to understand the Chinese. And, and that, that, is, that is quite threatening for quite a lot of them. And uh, I think, again, what our role, uh, I, I'll talk about the solutions that we've come up for, for them here, our role is to encourage these small group that are going abroad and spending time in other cultures to come back and to, to get the message across to them. 
Um, but again, the, the challenge is, is very much around this very high quality R&D focused business and uh, making it make sense in a very commercial, uh, low cost business in China. Uh, and trying to get all these guys, all these engineers who worked in Germany to open up and to understand what they've got to do to make the company and the product successful in markets like that. So that's, uh, that's Yid Abeg. Um, Tesco, um, Tesco, we, your process, we worked briefly with um, when they just started their internationalization process. Um, and we were brought in uh, to use a, a tool, which some of you may know, which is called um, the International Profiler. It's a profiling tool, which is to raise awareness of the challenges of working internationally. So we use the tool, coach some of the people who are going to work in their international vision. In those, in those days, it was just 60 people, actually. Of course, it's much, much bigger now. And they've been rolling out Tesco across the world with a lot of success, um, particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, I don't know about I don't know about Croatia. Have you got Tesco in Croatia? No. Okay. Well, I'm sure it's coming. So. Um, but uh, you know, and in, in Thailand, they've been so very successful as, in Southeast Asia as a whole. However. They, they run into they run into failures, and some of you may have may have seen in the news just recently. They've actually withdrawn from Japan, um, and they've also withdrawn from Taiwan, and they're also struggling. They they put they they set up a business in the states called Fresh and Easy, and they're struggling to make money there. I mean, this is I think now almost ten years down the road, maybe maybe six years down the road, and they're still not making money in the states. So this, this and, and actually I've, I've talked to Nestle, uh, who I know very well, about you know, why, why has Tesco got it wrong, or perhaps got it wrong in the States, and also in Japan, and, and they said to me, well, they didn't talk to people, they didn't come, for example, they should have come and talked to us. You know, we've been doing this for 150 years, why didn't they come and talk to us? But of course, you know, the, the retailers are the gods, and the suppliers of the Nestle, very much sort of second class citizen. So, so they didn't. And I think uh, my analysis of what went wrong in Japan, Taiwan, and perhaps in the States is that there's a very big difference between setting up a business in a very well established majority <coughs> culture, such as Japan and the States, and setting up uh, a business in, in a much more of an emerging economy in, in Eastern Europe or in Southeast Asia. The challenge is very, di very different. And I think there's a sort of, dare I say, arrogance which can happen to companies that are very, very successful in their own markets. And an assumption that it will work elsewhere, their model will work elsewhere. They, I mean, I don't want to go into too much depth, but I think they misunderstood consumer preferences in Japan. And so that's why they've had to pull out with a, with a very, very big loss. Um, and uh, Max Arono, Max Arono, I, I work with this part of this, the business, an amazing building in Geneva. Uh, I, this is the old Serono part of the business, which is a pharmaceutical business, particularly strong in neurological drugs. Um, the, the great debate, a lot of the research is into multiple sclerosis. Um, Unfortunately, yet to make a really major breakthrough in that area, but a lot of the people that I work with are in that area. Um, but they've been bought by MEC, which is a chemical business, not a pharmaceutical business, in Darmstadt. And much, much bigger. And uh, they also have an operation, in a sort of hub in Boston. And so I'm working here with the people in, uh, in Geneva. And the last year, as this takeover has sort of begun to really set in, uh, the people I'm working with get more and more stressed. And they get more and more stressed partly because they feel that Darmstadt just doesn't understand them. They, they, they don't understand pharmaceuticals is not the same. I mean, it's pretty obvious stuff. You'd think they would understand that, but a lot of people don't. Um, and um, they also... They also don't understand them because they're not, at the moment, delivering the results that Merck and Darmstadt expected them to do. 
Uh, and they're working in a, a very, very uncertain world. Um, and I think more than any other client, what I struggle with, with these groups, I mean, often junior middle managers that I have, is that they, they, what they're saying to me is, Jeremy, yes, yes, you know, what you're doing is helpful and it will help us with our teams, but what do we do with our very uh, uncertain team members who, who really aren't sure about their futures? How, how, can, how can we communicate successfully with them? How can we, how can we reassure them? Uh, that, that's the environment. So they're working in a very tough environment uh, with a, a great deal of uncertainty. So that's, that for me, is their biggest, uh, biggest challenge. Okay, so that's um, all I wanted to say about knowledge. I mean, what, what a, the message I'd like to leave you there is that when, when we're working on knowledge, um, I think what we're trying to do is to get our participants to have insights into their own organizational cultures. And using those insights that they have into their own company cultures, organizational cultures, to be able to understand better uh, the target cultures that they're working with, the target cultures being other companies. So that, that has, that, that's what I see uh, my role at. So that's the knowledge side of things. And what, and what really supports that knowledge in terms of that, gaining that knowledge uh, is a very uh, fundamental skill uh, where I, I start with all my training programs. And it is with um, mindfulness. Um, so what do I mean by mindfulness? I mean, it, it, my mindfulness for, for me uh, is to develop in our participants the ability to observe and reflect and to understand, uh, to decenter, if you like, to step away, to distance. <laughs> A helicopter. I mean, there are lots of ways of putting it, but you know, a lot of the, a lot of these people who are thrust into a lot of very, as I said, very very challenging situations, uh, they find that difficult to do. They find that difficult to step back. And um, the, the approach that we use uh, is to be firstly mindful about yourself uh, and to reflect on what you bring. To the situation, so you know, your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses. So be mindful about that, and use that mindfulness that you have about yourself to be mindful about other people. It's 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 not an easy thing to sell in a way, because obviously we all know that our clients are in a very stressful, results-focused world. So you know, if you're saying, well, actually, the answer to this is to be more mindful. It's not, it's, not, it's not an easy equation, um, but I think it's a very powerful one. And once, they, and once they grasp it, once they understand what you're trying to do with them, uh, I think it, you know, it stays with them, and it can be very helpful in lots of aspects of their, their working lives. And I'll, I'll, um, I'm going to show you a little bit of video in a moment, and, uh, and hopefully that will come across a bit more strongly what I, what I mean by mindfulness. So firstly, firstly mindfulness, uh, which will help with their building of knowledge, uh, 